Hello friends, welcome to CC Gurukul Live Lectures. Dear friends, yet again we are going to talk in our series on comparative politics. We are going to discuss in detail theories of political representation and electoral system. This is the first lecture where we are going to give you in-depth knowledge. And for the discussion, we have with us in our studios Dr. Satish Kumar Jha. Dr. Satish Kumar Jha is Associate Professor in Department of Political Science, Arabhata College, University of Delhi. Dr. Jha is a prolific professor and we are delighted to have him in the studio because every time through him we get into knowledge on various topics of uh, political science. Friends, if you wish to ask questions from Dr. Satish Kumar Jha on today's topic, then feel free to talk to us through our toll-free number. Our number is 1-800-110-430. I repeat, our number is one eight double zero double one zero four three zero. Now I would like to welcome our guest, Dr. Satish Kumar Shah, once again. Hello, sir. Welcome to the lecture. Thank you, Geetha ji, and good afternoon. Uh, today's lecture we are going to devote on uh, uh, the theme in that is political representation, and uh, in fact we should remember one thing that this issue that is political representation is as much important in political theory as perhaps in comparative politics. Uh, in political science. So therefore, what we find that political representation, this entire issue has been debated both within uh, you know, political theory and comparative politics by political scientists uh, over the years and decades and ages. Uh, and therefore, it uh, you know, occupies a very important place in the entire discourse uh, in political science and uh, to some extent one can say in social science as well. But there are many issues involved in it uh, because, you know, first of all, we should remember that representation, political representation, uh, which basically, uh, you know, gets translated into reality, uh, political reality uh, in democratic process through electoral system. Uh, there are different theories governing both political representation as well as, uh, you know, the electoral system. Uh, and those theories are important to make sense of this topic that what does uh, you know it mean but at the same time we should also remember that this entire evolution of the concept of political uh, you know representation uh, has uh, you know taken uh, different forms over the years as and when the you know the changes were taking place in the entire democratic process democratic institutions and democratic milieu uh, not in one society but many societies but interestingly you know it started in the western uh, you know, societies in modern times because, you know, the advent of liberal democracy, you know, heralded this new uh, churning so far as democratic theory is concerned. Uh, because uh, as we know that democracy as a concept is not modern. In fact, we have had instances of uh, thinkers, uh, scholars uh, reflecting and dilating on this issue of uh, democracy even in ancient time. Particularly the Greek thinkers uh, were the foremost uh, you know, are the foremost examples uh, when they reflected on these issues, many of them negatively, but many of them also in positive light. But even outside the Greek tradition, we have had many instances from the Eastern world, particularly in India, as we know, that in ancient time, uh, you know, the Buddhism, particularly the, you know, Buddhist, you know, Shanghas are normally believed to be, uh, to have, you know, uh, govern themselves on democratic principle. Uh, so there are a number of instances. In fact, republics uh, emerged in ancient India, and we have also heard about these elected monarchies in cer certain parts of, uh, you know, you know, India. So therefore, in fact, from both east and the west in ancient time, uh, we have heard that you know how this democracy as an idea, as a principle, as a normative principle of governance uh, was available and people were aware and familiar with the system. But what has happened uh, that the modern uh, period added new dimension to this entire discourse on democracy and this new dimension was basically you know the transmutation of this entire concept from direct to the indirect process. Uh, normally what we call direct democracy is associated with the smaller city states of the Greek period or the smaller societies where people basically believed in self-rule, they governed themselves in smaller bodies, uh, in assemblies, and therefore, you know, this idea of self-rule was at the heart of this entire discourse of direct democracy, you know, and at that time. But what happened? That later on, 
particularly in modern times uh, with the emergence of you know the large states with the emergence of you know more uh, you know bigger societies uh, after particularly 16th and 17th century in Europe largely on account of many developments most importantly you know the rise of modern nation state particularly treaty of westphalia after 30 years long religious warfare in the europe uh, in europe and then of course a rise of capitalism and many other developments which unified the territories in europe along you know national uh, identities uh, and other uh, similar developments took place so what happened that with the rise of this, this big unit uh, of political uh, you know political society or one can say that the emergence of this larger societies along with the presence of uh, big states huge states necessitated a new uh, you know way to you know new way to democratically govern societies and it is in this context that we should remember this entire discourse of political representation emerged in fact uh, one can say that the greeks for greeks this idea of representation uh, would have appeared totally preposterous uh, because you know they would have asked a question that how can people uh, be said to be governing uh, themselves uh, if a separate class of rulers exists uh, you know side by side because you know if rulers are not the part of this governing class how can it be said that it is an instance of uh, you know a self rule so therefore this idea of representation was not only outlandish but they would have considered it totally preposterous but you know similar uh, you know uh, similar position was reiterated later also uh, in a different form by some of the modern thinkers uh, for example many of us are familiar uh, with you know rousseau the french philosopher who 18 in who in 18th century uh, in fact gave a similar posture when he said that the moment you give yourself to representatives that means you are not free so therefore uh, in fact this entire concept of general will he basically brought into his entire discourse of uh, democracy basically signaled this aspect that he was also for a non representative uh, mode of uh, you know democratic governance one can say the self rule or the direct democracy and subsequently <coughs> sorry from time to time we find that you know uh, you know the thinker scholars have been uh, raking up this issue uh, you know once in a while uh, that how far this system based on representatives where basically representatives are politically standing uh, for another person another group another entity uh, can be called truly democratic because this entire idea of representative and represented the relationship between the two uh, the kind of distance which happens between the two the representatives and represented are represented so therefore this distance in spite of this distance can we say that it is democratic uh, because the way uh, the will is being represented uh, does it truly reflect the will of the people uh, the kind of policies which are formulated the kind of implementation which is done on behalf of the people how much truthfully they carry out that process that that will so this these poses have been coming off and on and therefore we hear even today in contemporary times many scholars like patman and others when they talk of participation as a sense of democracy they simply basically try to question this entire spirit of representative democracy because represent, representative democracy uh, in other words in their view uh, you know results into dilution of this entire concept of general will popular sovereignty and therefore you know they argue for a different mode of uh, you know democratic governance that is uh, through self rule and number of you know instruments are also discussed along with this instrument like uh, you know plebiscite instrument like uh, referendum instrument like uh, you know recall number of initiatives so number of you know tools are also there and as you know there is one country where some of these tools are also uh, in operation that is switzerland so therefore uh, in fact one thing we should remember that this transition from you know self rule that is direct democracy uh, or one can say participative democracy to this representative democracy has been marked with lot of debates lot of controversies and lot of you know criticisms but nonetheless this is a fact of the life today the entire world is basically governed 
through this um, in this manner that is through a representative system and therefore this electoral system because this entire discussion uh, will be spread into few lectures and that will be dealing with both the theories of representation as well as theories of electoral system so electoral system has been devised as a mechanism to basically realize this ideal of uh, representation that though the representatives are standing uh, for you know another person they are standing for certain groups they are standing for certain entities but nonetheless uh, you know this standing should be done in a manner where they truthfully carry out the mandate given to them by the electorates by the voters by the constituents they should be basically truthful uh, to the trust reposed in them and therefore you know number of electoral systems the theories of electoral system today exist from first pass first pass the pop system to the proportional representation and there are many variants of proportional representation we will be basically discussing all of them in course of our discussion of this topic so therefore uh, in fact this is something we should remember that how this entire idea of representation has emerged the idea of representative democracy has come into existence and as i mentioned today there is no basically democratic society in the world which is not relying on this a uh, mode of governance that is representative mode of uh, democratic governance of course there are variations there are you know institutions which are considered basically uh, you know uh, the institutions which represent the people's will sometimes you know in britain it can be said that the parliament represents that will of the people whereas united states of america offers a different model where it is basically based on separation of power uh, you know both horizontal and vertical horizontal among three institutions legislature executive and judiciary and vertical uh, between the states and the federation the center so therefore uh, there is no one institution united states of america which can be called that truly A, a institution where the will of the people or is one institution which is the repository of the will of the people but you know it is basically a spread over all these institutions and processes and that has been done intentionally in order to checkmate power with the power because they always believed in the dictum that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely so therefore they basically wanted to checkmate power by power and therefore this entire doctrine of separation of power initially you know espoused by or one can say articulated by locke but later on theorized by you know montesquieu uh, in fact uh, has been implemented in united states of america and the federalism their own innovation the innovation of uh, their own statesmen their own thinkers their own mind the federalist paper madison and others when they talked of this federal governance they innovated a new mode of dividing power are uh, dividing sovereignty what today is called shared rule and therefore this idea of shared rule was essentially meant to govern society in a manner where power is checkmated uh, by power so therefore in fact this modern democracy all over the world is basically based on this principle of representative democracy and there are certain of course uh, societies certain countries i mentioned switzerland where you know certain uh, you know tools of uh, make, or certain mechanisms have been devised uh, to make this process more representative at least the will of the people uh, should be always present uh, in the process of decision making and therefore you know when we talk of recall initiative uh, you know and other uh, you know you know modes or one uh, other techniques through which this will of the people is uh, basically imposed on the representative this is basically was uh, you know this was done essentially uh, to 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 demonstrate that though representatives have been elected by the people in elections but nonetheless it is the popular will the popular sovereignty which is sovereign and therefore that sovereignty uh, should be from time to time uh, be reflected uh, that sovereign will should be consulted that sovereign will should be honored and the elections of course are a kind of transfer of that will one can say the transfer of that mandate but it is not all exhaustive in the five year or four year time period during which uh, you know the representatives are elected on certain occasions on certain issues uh, people should be consulted whether they still you know 
have the similar opinion when they elected the representatives or that whether that opinion has changed. So that is basically idea today. But nonetheless, in spite of having these mechanisms, they are also basically a system or one can say the example of representative form of government, even the plebiscite. Many countries which are purely, uh, you know, representative in both form and in substance. Uh, in fact, those systems also have spaces for uh, such things like referendum and plebiscite on certain issues. Uh, in fact, in some of the states, in United States of America, as we know, that this system that is, you know, initiative, uh, recall and other things are practiced, but not at the uh, larger national level. So therefore, in fact, what has happened that in spite of such, uh, you know, precautions which have been taken, in spite of such, uh, you know, mechanisms which have been devised, but nonetheless, fact of the matter is that we live in a world which is basically basically based on the idea of representative uh, democracy or one can say indirect democracy or uh, where basically you know the system functions on basis of elections in which the constituents the voters the electors elect their representatives and those elect and those representatives act as legislators and those you know representatives act like executive uh, to execute the policies. So this is basically one thing we should remember. And as I already mentioned, this transition from the direct to indirect has been largely on account of uh, the expansion in the size of uh, the state authority, largely on account of the expansion of uh, the societies, largely on account of the complexities uh, which emerged uh, with you know, the transition from feudalism to capitalism largely on account of number of challenges uh, which basically came up due to the advent of you know the modern era so therefore uh, you know because of these changes it became a necessity and therefore you know the idea was uh, that how to have a system uh, where this you know a complex big and uh, you know challenging uh, development uh, should be uh, basically tackled and handled and this was in this context this idea of uh, representation and representative government emerged now there are many thinkers who have basically contributed on this issue of representation and therefore today we have theories of representation because you know there is no one way in which one can say that all thinkers looked at this idea of representation that how politically people should stand for another person uh, what should be the method and mechanism through which this process can be more congenial for democratic governance. And therefore, what we find uh, that, you know, uh, when they discovered what they thought that there was a requirement of a new ways in which people could shape the collective decision that, you know, new ways, basically that this quest for the new ways led to multiple theories on political representation. But of course, one thing we should remember. The idea always was to have a system or a theory of representation which is compatible, which basically establishes some compatibility between the massive state on the one hand and the extended suffrage uh, which was required because, you know, gradually, you know, this today we live in an era which is known for universal adult franchise that all adult members of the society, be it men, women, of different classes, different races, different ethnic groups, all should be uh, endowed with the power to vote. That is called universal adult suffrage. Uh, one man, one vote, one woman, one vote. This is the principle on which basically today's democracy and the democratic governance is premised. Therefore, you know, when this uh, entire idea of the new ways were being thought of, uh, in order to, uh, you know, in order to establish a system where people could shape the collective decisions more, uh, you know, as per their wishes or as per their will, uh, you know, the idea was to have a system where this compatibility is also, uh, you know, kept in mind. The compatibility between the massive state on the one hand and on the other hand, this extended suffrage uh, which was required because, you know, this suffrage also didn't happen, universal adult suffrage also didn't happen uh, just without uh, much effort. In fact, uh, as we know that there was a very powerful suffrage movement uh, in Europe. In fact, women got enfranchised uh, much later in 20th century. And that enfranchisement was largely on account of a powerful movement, which is known as suffrage movement. So this is something we should remember, that this transition from direct to indirect, from 
you know, participatory, uh, you know, smaller assemblies to, uh, you know, the larger representative bodies like legislature. Uh, in fact, this entire transition uh, was marked by number of churnings and therefore we have number of theories on political representation and electoral system today. Now coming to this issue of representation, because representation as we know is not only confined to this, uh, you know, to the area of political science. In fact, literature and other social sciences also talk about representation but in a different form. For example, uh, representation, the word representation connotes uh, that it should uh, reflect something uh, which itself, uh, which is not basically inherent in it and how this can happen. For example, one can say that a flag which a nation possesses, that flag represents the entire nation. Though of course, nation is a different entity and flag is a different entity. But nonetheless, that flag becomes the symbol of a nation. So therefore, the symbolism, symbolism of representation. Because through this process of representation, one entity gets reflected into the another. For example, lawyer uh, is one entity who is basically in knowledge, possession of a knowledge of law. He represents his client in the court so far as his interests are concerned. So client and lawyer are two different entities. But when lawyer stands for his client or her client in a courtroom, in fact the interest of the client gets merge with the interest of the lawyer at least on that moment when he is representing or she is representing uh, his or her client. Similarly, the elected politicians, though they are representing voters, they are representing different districts, they are representing different parties, but nonetheless, you know, on those moments or one can say uh, on, on uh, for a certain period, these elected politicians become the symbol of their voters, districts and the parties. In fact, their interests in fact gets merged with the interest of the representative. Now, this is basically the reason why this so much debate has happened. That this can, one can, can uh, you know, we say that the interests of the politicians are overpowered by the interests of the voters. That, in, you know, politicians or the representatives completely forget their own interests or sublimate or one kind of submerges, they submerge their interest in the interests of the voters. So two interests become one or in spite of, you know, being a representative, in spite of taking the oath, in spite of, you know, going to the voters with their manifesto, uh, you know, the representatives retain their own interests. And they, it can never be said that the representatives do not have their own interests. In fact, of course, they carry out the interest of the voters. But when there is a conflict between the two, his own interest and the interest of the voters, the representatives would be essentially guided by their own interest. This is the criticism which has been leveled by the, you know, the votaries of participatory democracy or advocate of those who still believe that the self-rule does not mean or democracy does not mean that it should function uh, through a representative mode. So therefore, we find that a lot of debates have happened on this issue. That is on political representation. Now, of course, uh, you know, one, one thing we should remember uh, that, you know, this 18th century, I mentioned that Rousseau wrecked up this issue. And then later on, we find that this criticism, uh, we often find, particularly when deal with the theories of democracy, particularly, you know, the elitist theory of democracy, the kind of argument they have put forth. For example, we are aware about this, uh, you know, the German scholar Robert Mitchell, uh, when he talked of iron law of oligarchy, particularly on basis of his study of different political parties. And therefore, when he talked about, when he basically interpreted this representative government, uh, you know, Mitchell felt that under representative government, uh, the difference between democracy and monarchy uh, has become literally insignificant. There is not much difference between what demo monarchy was and what democracy is today. Uh, in fact, one can, uh, in fact, Mitchell goes to the extent that said that this difference may not be in substance, but it is definitely in form. For example, in place of kings and emperors of earlier times, what, ha what has happened that number of kinglets have replaced the kings and emperors through this representative democracy. So therefore, uh, Mitchell, uh, Mitchell is one uh, scholar, uh, one thinker uh, later who also uh, raised this issue 
that this representative democracy has basically diluted this entire spirit of self-government, self-rule, popular will and popular sovereignty. Now, therefore, uh, in fact, we should remember that this matter has been coming up again and again. This quest for direct democracy, quest for, you know, a participative democracy, quest for a system of democracy in which people are not dependent on the sweet will of their representatives has been coming up, coming up again and again. In recent years, this entire debate on representation has acquired new dimension with the rise of communitarian and multicultural thinkers when a new issue has been uh, basically problematized, that issue of group representation. The group, you know, representation of minorities, representation of ethnic groups, representation of women. And the, this entire group theory of representation has added a new dimension to already existing number of complexities which were associated with these theories of representation. Because this entire argument for this group representation is based on this principle that can a male member of society uh, represent the interest of women because the interest of women and the male are totally different by nature by birth by their you know by the by, by their entire constitute and the way they are constituted socially and therefore uh, can male members be representative of women this issue has been raised by the feminist movement now similarly this issue came up uh, between the black and the white, the racial problem, United States of America and many other countries. Now, this issue has also come up in context of the ethnic uh, people, uh, different ethnic groups in society, particularly where you have a system of representation which is called majoritarian. And therefore, how to have a system where the interest of the minorities can also be uh, protected. So, therefore, this entire advent of this new theory of group uh, representation, uh, particularly after the rise of communitarianism and multiculturalism, have added new dimension to this entire discourse of political representation. And of today, as we know, that many arguments, uh, basically, which have been put forth by the feminists, uh, they are basically integral to this entire discourse of uh, political representation. And it is at times referred as a theory of representation, which is the politics of presence, because they want to be present on the site of decision making, because the decisions about them cannot be taken by others who are not like them. So therefore, as Hannah Pitkin, one of uh, you know the eminent theorists on political representation, has characterized it as a descriptive representation. In other words, one can say the representatives and the representatives, uh, you know, represented uh, representatives should be the mirror image of the represented. So therefore, in fact, they should be mirroring the identities of their constituents. So this entire idea of group representation has already added, has added a new dimension to this idea of uh, group representation today. Now, in fact, uh, before we proceed uh, to the discussion of the four different, uh, you know, principles through which this representative democracy has been understood, uh, you know, in recent years, and those four principles are uh, highly important. Uh, for example, as you know, those four principles are the idea of uh, representation uh, through, uh, you know, trust, through mandate, through delegate and through sameness. So therefore, these four principles on basis of which you know, scholars and thinkers have debated this issue. Uh, in fact, one thing we should remember that this entire idea of political representation in modern time, uh, of course, at times people say that it was you know, Burke and his uh, Bristol address which laid the foundation of both political party and representation. But we should remember that it was Thomas Penn who was the first author to graft this representative on democracy. Uh, because, you know, of course, he was a British-born political activist, and he had experienced both French and American Revolution. And what, you know, Thomas Penn did, particularly in his famous book, Rights of the Man, uh, that, you know, he argued for a system, uh, you know, uh, under which this representative uh, mode of, governance and representative mode of democracy uh, could become a reality. Uh, in fact, uh, he argued that, you know, original simple democracy, uh, that is the basically democracy of ancient time, which I was referring to as uh, the Greek city-states, 
that original simple democracy is uh, incapable of extension today uh, due to you know uh, you know due to number of uh, you know developments uh, and therefore by grafting representative on democracy we arrive at a system of government which could be capable of embracing uh, the confederation of interests these are the words of you know thomas pen in his book rights of the man now what happened that in ancient time when this idea of self rule was basically idealized uh, you know the entire reference point used to be the size of the assemblies size of the city states uh, so that uh, you know it could be it could become manageable in terms of the participation of the citizens uh, in fact upper limit for republic uh, was drawn by many thinkers uh, because you know the purpose was that if the number of people are less then they could gather at a place and they could hear their speaker so therefore this was the purpose of having a smaller uh, units of administration and governance in ancient time but in modern time the concern has changed the concern has not been uh, with making the unit political unit smaller in order to enable people to gather at one place and listen to the speaker or participate but rather has been that how the people as a whole the population or one can say that citizens are uh, should be armed with certain instruments through which they could exert some control on their rulers in spite of the fact they are not basically sitting face to face and they are not part of the same assembly so therefore the modern concern has been more on devising mechanisms to establish a better control on the representatives because it was taken for granted that due to the complexity of size due to the complexity of you know society due to the size of uh, you know administration due to the size of the government uh, in fact this distance between the represented and the representatives was a foregone conclusion so therefore in spite of distance how this could be done and therefore in fact we should remember that today when we talk of democracy mostly we refer to liberal democracy and what is difference between liberal democracy and the classical democracy it is largely on account of these facts that liberal democracy is premised on the principle of law constitution a uh, control mechanism uh, one can say separation of power checks and balances are product of this system that how you know power could be checkmated how the interest of representatives could be neutralized by certain mechanisms how you know this law not rule of the people because that was basically the dictum that was the mantra of you know the direct democracy of ancient time today's the major mantra is not the rule of the people but rule of the law and how this rule of law could be a reality how that rule of law could be actualized that has been the concern of the modern minds particularly on democracy and therefore we have seen that a scholar after scholar thinker after thinker beat bark John Stuart Mill uh, Thomas Penn uh, in fact even later many other uh, scholars and thinkers who have basically enriched this uh, entire discourse on representation political representation they have been talking about this issue primarily from this standpoint that how to have a very effective mechanism control mechanism of people over their representatives and over the decisions of their representatives now of course uh, you know one thinker uh, one scholar uh, often comes to our mind when we talk of these issues he is sun peter uh, you know particularly his famous book capitalism socialism and democracy uh, you know published in 1940 uh, you know 3 and now in fact uh, sun peter uh, made a very you know perceptive and one can say uh, that very insightful comment Uh, because earlier we were talking about individuals uh, as agents of democracy or agencies of this process but sun peter you know shifted this entire goal post sun peter said that in modern democracies after the advent of the party system this entire idea of uh, you know democracy or individuals or citizens as agents uh, basically have become insignificant uh, in fact it is largely a competition Uh, in this representative democracy of modern times uh, between 
uh, you know, the political parties and among political parties. And so far as the voters, the electors are concerned, the constituents are concerned, their only, uh, you know, satisfaction is that they get a chance to accept and rep reject the representatives foisted on them by the political parties. So therefore, uh, in fact, uh, Sumpita uh, also made another very, you know, in, in, insightful comment. In fact, the Sumpita said that, you know, this purpose of this entire process of election or this representation is not to carry out the will or one can say the representatives are not there to carry out the will of the people and the people are not there to impose their will on their representatives. Rather, the purpose is to produce a government. Now, how that government is produced through election, this is the entire purpose behind having this entire edifice of representative democracy. Because when government is formed after the competition among political parties uh, in the hustings through electoral means, then the purpose of voter is over or the one can say the job of the voter is over. And then it becomes basically the will of the representatives, the will of the political parties, which basically acts, which basically governs, not the will of the people. So therefore, this entire elitist you know, attack on this idea uh, has been there. From Mitchells, we have seen Sumpita and number of other people. Even Robert Dahl and others later years when they talked of polyarchies, of course, in terms of existence of multiple interests through groups in societies and how the competition among those groups, basically in their opinion, were the part of this entire uh, new process of democratization. So therefore, uh, in fact, uh, one thing we should remember that this is how this entire idea of uh, the, you know, political representation has acquired new momentum uh, in 20th century and 21st century. As I mentioned, that in 21st century, in fact, communitarians and multiculturalists have added new dimension uh, by bringing in this question of uh, group identities and group interests. Because it was alleged that the liberal democratic theory, which was wedded to the principle of liberalism, essentially prioritized individual and looked at individual as unencumbered self, where the individual was basically an abstraction, or individual had no connection uh, with their social roots, or individual uh, didn't have any group identity. And therefore, they talked of individual rights at the cost of the group identities and group rights. Now, these you know, communitarians and multiculturalists like Kamlika, Shandl, and many others have raised a new issue uh, in uh, basically late 20th century and the 21st century. And that has basically given a new dimension to this entire debate on political representation. And as I mentioned earlier, that the feminist movements, or one can say that many other movements in many societies today are taking clue from these theories and they are talking about. Uh, you know, the hollowness of this representative democracy, where they talk of democracy, but in the, in, you know, in the real sense, they hollow it out. So therefore, uh, these are some of the debates. And uh, along this, around, around these debates, we have to see the four principles of political representation, which have been problematized. That is the trust, the principle of trust, the principle of, uh, you know, delegate, uh, the pr principle of mandate, and the principle of sameness. And thinkers are divided on these four issues, be it Burke, be it uh, you know, Penn, be it John Stuart Mill, or be it these communitarians. So we'll be taking up these all four principles in course of our discussion on this topic. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for giving us this productive uh, session. Friends, you are requested to call us if you have uh, any question. Until then, you ask your questions. I am here to ask questions from Dr. Satish Kumar Jha. If you wish to ask questions, then uh, talk to us through our toll-free number. Our number is one eight double zero double one zero four three zero. I repeat, our number is one eight double zero double one zero four three zero. Dear friends, we are waiting for your calls and I'm question answer. I'm asking questions from Dr. Satish. Kumar Kumar Jha on your part. So welcome once again and uh, today we are talking about uh, uh, the electoral system as well as the political representation in India. Sir, if we talk uh, about uh, the democratic country like uh, ours, uh, so what is the importance of uh, the electoral system in the democratic countries? Oh yes, very important question uh, because India is of course a uh, late cover so far as this entire process of democratization is concerned. Uh, in fact, a very eminent uh, political uh, you know, social scientist 
Huntington when he talks of three waves of democracy. Uh, he puts India in the category of second wave, particularly after Second World War. But we should remember one thing that India has uh, has had uh, some achievements uh, in uh, you know in uh, in terms of uh, the theories of democracy. As I was mentioning, that the recent challenges uh, on this issue of representation has largely come from uh, the you know advocates of group representation, like feminists, you know, and other groups in India. Uh, much before you know this uh, communitarianism and multiculturalism as theories emerged, what we find uh, that when the constitution was being drafted in the constituent assembly, people were alive to this reality. Therefore, India is perhaps an exceptional case where in the constitution, much before this group identities and group rights were brought on the you know agenda of uh, you know political theorists and political thinkers. In fact, India's constitution talks about both individual rights and the group rights. Even the United Nations Declaration on Universal Declaration of Rights, you know, in 1948, didn't uh, mention group rights. It came only through subsequent amendments and you know and covenants. But that way, India talked of group rights and individual rights. But the issue of political representation was at the back of this entire thing when we look at India's constitution. Because at that time, you must be knowing when Britishers were ruling over India. In fact, there are a lot of churnings going on in India itself. One, of course, was between the colonialism and nationalism. And Indian National Congress represented that you know, contradiction. But within India, there were a number of you know, uh, uh, politics, number of issues which had come up along this group identities. And many of you, uh, many of us uh, today remember and acknowledge the contribution of B.R. Ambedkar. Because Ambedkar as the leader of depressed class federation, when he talked of, when he raised this issue of representation, that how the Dalit interests could be properly represented in a future democratic polity in India. And the kind of, you know, the churning we find taking place in India at that time, uh, where, you know, having a uh, lot of implications from the point of view of democratic governance. So on account of all these journeys, we find that the constituent assembly uh, took up this issue very seriously. Of course, one thing we should remember that the electoral system, which basically they settled for finally, are nothing new because they were part of the larger uh, liberal democratic you know, discourse of the West. The two systems through which Indian democracy functions of elections are concerned. One is what is called plurality system, majoritarian system or in a more sophisticated uh, way one can put it first past the post system the way Lok Sabha and you know the Bilham Sabhas are elected but there is also a parallel system that is called proportional representation on basis of which you have the Raj Sabha that is upper house of parliament is constituted and the upper houses in many states that is legislative councils are constituted even president of India is elected through that system so the two systems of electoral systems were devised but nonetheless we should remember we have a special provision for reservation of seats for you know certain marginalized and disprivileged sections of society particular scheduled caste and scheduled tribe in on basically in assemblage so therefore all these things suggest that how indian discourse on democracy was uh, you know deeply entrenched into this entire issues and it was not only alive to this situation, but it was continuously reflecting. And some of the contributions they made, in fact, were recognized in political theory much later, particularly when Canada and many other countries had a problem of, you know, immigrants and, you know, the people who basically came from other societies. And therefore, they understood the value and meaning of multiculturalism, pluralism, uh, because earlier they were only familiar with homogeneous societies. But now they discover that when the new challenges are coming up, they have to go beyond their established perception about representation. And therefore, uh, these things are today being recognized. But India has played a very important role in making this contribution. Now, sir, we would like to ask you, uh, are there any chances of failure of the electoral system? If yes, what are the causes? What are oh, the yes. reasons? This is another important question. And of course, we'll be having more detailed discussion in course of our, you know, lectures which will be spread in few parts uh, because there are limitations uh, in fact uh, there are criticisms and there are uh, weaknesses definitely as it is called majoritarian system 
why it is called majoritarian system that is first past the post system or plurality, plurality system that one is elected on basis of the majority of votes polled and if one gets majority of votes one is elected but that does not ensure that the elected person represent the majority of the people in the society because for example uh, only 50% voters turn out to vote exactly. out of 50% if you get uh, if you get the majority of votes that means if someone gets 30 you know uh, you know 26% even then one can be elected even less than that depending how many contenders are there so with minority votes you can become the representative so there is no guarantee that those who are representing you are representing the, ma in the majority of the people in that constituency that is criticism number one the another criticism which is often leveled and we'll have more discussion on this when we'll have the theories of electoral system that elects you know uh, you know representatives are elected through electoral process once they are elected for next five years they are supposed to carry out their responsibility uh, as per the mandate given you know to them by the voters but in five years time uh, you know there is no not much connect between the voters and the representatives they act at their own will though basically understanding as i was mentioning behind this entire evolution was that the representative representatives should be truthfully carry out the mandate given to them but this has been observed not only in india but world over the representative democracy is failing today in establishing that connect between representatives and representatives because that connect is no longer there voters come only you know representatives come back to their voters only during election time in between hardly you know representatives have any concerns for their constituents they don't nurture they don't nourish their constituencies they take them for granted and therefore uh, you must have heard when anti corruption movement in india was growing few years ago they talked about many mechanisms through which democracy could be made more meaningful and they talked about uh, you know a referendum and other modes through which you know the people should be consulted before taking important decisions about them as i mentioned switzerland and many other democracies in the west are already having this recall initiative referendum mechanism but now this is being debated in india this is being debated in many countries that should we also devise a mechanism that between five years between the two points between the point of election and the next election can we have a mechanism through, through which the voters can render more effective control on the representatives mm -hmm. and how that control can be you know effected and some of the mechanisms we are familiar in political science as i mentioned referendum even today you know on important issues referendum is taken in europe as we know on issue of brexit england went for a referendum so i mean these things are there but it's the new technology in you know in, in, in operation today with uh, a kind of revolution in information technology now people are saying that we should think that how this technology can be put to service to this cause that people can be more effective render more effective control on the representative so that is another weakness the next other you know another weakness which is often pointed out that idea of representative democracy was that representatives will be basically acting for their uh, voters and truthfully discharge their responsibility in good faith but today with the coming of political parties what has happened the representatives major loyalty is not to the voters but to their political parties so therefore what happened that most of the times they carry out the mandate of their parties not their voters so the, now a new contradiction is surfacing contradiction of interest contradiction of interest between the voters the parties and the representatives so it's a tea party one can say a situation today the representatives are filtered by parties therefore parties expect them to act as per their wishes and therefore the representatives though voted by the represented but nonetheless they feel that their major loyalty lies with the political party so these are the new challenges which are coming up but there are many theories also which are being built around these issues and we will have the chance in course of our discussion to delve deep into these issues that how the new challenges have to be tackled where the democracy the idea of democracy could be made more you know meaningful
where the idea of self-rule through representative democracy could be realized. So we are talking about the political representation and likewise we are talking about uh, a political party or the party system also. So uh, sh shouldn't be there a mandate to form a political party in such a way that it, th it uh, think in terms of uh, the public who or the people who are uh, voting? Right. In fact, this is another uh, you know in interesting uh, aspect you are raising uh, because political parties and therefore you must be aware that there are two types of parties today. One party uh, which comes uh, through a process which for in India one can say the freedom movement and then ideological you know uh, polarization society and certain class interests etc. Et but there is another process of party formation and one can say that is the movement based parties. Many parties are coming up out of a social movement and those movements have a clear cut uh, those parties have a clear cut mandate because normally social movements take place around certain issues and when they feel that other parties are not taking up our concerns then they go for formation of political parties because they feel that if we have our own political party then that will be our voice mm. and it will be strictly governed by our concerns so they can truly represent our interests now of course there is also a disadvantage here because parties as in political science we look at political party as an agency which is meant to do two things interest articulation and interest aggregation that not only articulating the interest of certain sections but aggregating the various interest and then filtering them to the system political system or the to the political class for policy formulation but here what happens that a sectional interest dominate over general interests. Sectional interests are considered more important than the common interests. And as we know, society does not have one interest or okay. multiple interests. Now, what happens that those preponderant interests, particularly the interest of the majority number of people, uh, become the reference point. And certain, you know, interests which are do not have the number to matter in democracy, those interests are ignored. So, there is a catch there also you know for having such a political process where interest based political parties come into existence be it on identities be it on some other interests social interests or class interests but nonetheless if the parties start functioning as simply interest group and only in terms of articulating interests not aggregating various interests then larger social concerns the larger common good would be the worst sufferer so there are of course catches here also but nonetheless it is also being seen as one way to make this representation more deeper or at least one more uh, one can say the representatives more truthful to the mandate of the represented with this note thank you sir thank you so much for giving us a deep insight into today's uh, topic uh, dear friends we would like to tell you all that there is lot more for you in store regarding this topic and in our forthcoming sessions we are going to discuss uh, more with the help of uh, dr satish kumar jha dear friends we believe that your questions your feedbacks are very very important for us and if you have any feel free to write to us at info.cec at nic.in. This lecture is going to be uploaded on YouTube soon. Keep watching us, keep writing us. With this note, we are taking your leave with the promise we are, meet, we are going to meet again soon. Thank you for watching CC Gurukul Live Lectures. Thank you, sir. Thank you once again.